So Emmanuel, if you want to start mm -hmm. with the poem. Sure. So I'm um, working on a collection of selected poems coming out in June. And this is one of the poems included and I thought it'd be appropriate for this event. It's called Madre America. If I were to give myself to you completely, would it matter that I didn't come from your womb? I have been thrown out of homes and abandoned by fathers looking for a place to settle and offer what little is left of this spirit. I speak your tongue and share the beds of your sons. I would fight in your battles if considered man enough for you. The dead eyes of innocent faces will not haunt this empty soul. Would you be my motherland? Would I be allowed to bathe in your oceans without drowning in your oil spills? Would you hold me when I die and grant me a final resting place? Madre, put down that newspaper and look at me closely. I much resemble your first kin before you were raped. I have tasted your tears and washed myself in your sorrow. Madre, would you grant me sanctuary from my sin of living, of loving? Your children do not want me to be part of your history. Your daughters do not care to heal these wounds. Madre, remind them that I have kept you strong. I have cleansed you, fed you, and kept you warm. You made me who I am today, but still unworthy of their affection. You were always full of love for all of us. You raised us the same, even when we took your splendor for granted. We may not have the same blood, but we are all connected. I don't want to lose this family. This heart belongs to you. America, you have been my mother and my father. The autumn leaves are falling and it is only summer. Do not let them keep me from coming into your arms. Do not let them imprison me with lies. Do not let them kill me for wanting to share in your devotion. Remind them that our differences is what makes this home more beautiful than any other. I am nourished and wise because of you. I look out the window and I'm not afraid of the wilderness outside. I only fear not finding my way back. Madre, I want to stay here with the others to protect you. I want to read musings and hear your stories. I want to stare at your skies at night and lay on your lands. Madre, I know it is not you but they that are jealous of our bond. Madre, educate us all to understand more than one language. I want to write poetry to someday teach in your schools. Peace belongs to all of us because of you, Madre. America. I will always be your child. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's really beautiful. Thank you. And Ms. Boogie just arrived. I'm just okay. struggling to spotlight her. So give me just a moment. Okay, awesome. Um, and I'll, I'll read um, Ms. Boogie's introduction. Um, so Ms. Boogie is an Afro-Latina Brooklyn-based MC and activist um, representing the T and LGBT. She still carries the rest of the acronym on her shoulders, pushing the envelope and speaking to the youth around the world about the importance of pride. Hello, Ms. Boogie. Thank you for joining us. Hi, am I heard? Yes, we can hear you. We just can't quite see you yet, but I think Jer is going to spotlight you. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello. I don't, I don't know what my lighting is giving right now, but I'll find out when we go live. <laughs> Give me one sec. Sorry, I'm going to okay. try removing the spotlight and, and putting it out again. Okay. Let me know if it's something on my end that I can troubleshoot. Thank you. Start video. Oh, there I go. <laughs> Oh, this is them. Hi. Hi. Oh my gosh, you look lovely. Oh, thank you. I'm just trying to find some battery light. <laughs> Hi, Xavier. How are you? I'm such a fan, by the way. I think this is my first time formally meeting you. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hey. Oh, there you go. I'm spotlighted now. Cool. Awesome. Hi, Christy. How are you? Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. 
Maybe we're neighbors. Why do you say that? Oh, I'm in Brooklyn. Oh, so I'm okay. I'm in I'm in East New York. <laughs> Nice, nice. All right. So um, I'm just going to start off by sharing a little bit of an introduction um, to the panel, but also like to the conference as well. Um, and so um, we're really kind of having this conference in honor of Gloria and Zeldua. Um, and so in her book, Borderlands slash La Frontera, the new Mestiza, um, Gloria and Zeldua gives a name to this concept of borderlands. You'll hear us say borderlands a lot tonight, I believe. <laughs> um, she opens the book by saying the psychological borderlands, the sexual borderlands and the spiritual borderlands are not particular to the Southwest. In fact, the borderlands are physically present wherever two or more cultures edge each other, where people of different races occupy the same territory, where under, lower, middle and upper classes touch, where the space between two individuals shrinks with intimacy. Um, and inspired by Anzal Dua, this conference and panel seeks to uplift the lives of those who grow from the borderlands, um, with a special emphasis on our Latina, Latino, and Latinx siblings in survival. So with that introduction, um, I will start with the first question on the panel. Um, how would you define resilience and survival and how do resilience and survival coexist in your life and art? And anybody can start. I'll okay. start if nobody okay. else is. Unless <laughs> I don't know. Um, could you hear me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. I don't know why my, um, I'm very bad at internet. Um, no, I, I just wanted to say that um, I think I define that as um, the, uh, the ability to name um, my freedom and um, mm -hmm. freedom from the things, the, the trauma, the pain, the, the people who um, have just inhibited my growth, my happiness, my joy. And then when I, I feel free from those things and I feel, um, you know, even if those things are still like messing with me I can still feel free from them um, when I'm creating something when I'm you know doing something experiencing some kind of joy or release um, and that's just that's how I define that feeling for me or that reality um I'll follow up I, I actually took notes so um bear with me um, so my, my answer to this was, um, you know, resilience is the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, um, toughness. Uh, survival is a state or fact of continuing to live or exist, typically despite difficult circumstances. In my personal history, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, being rejected as a teen after coming out as gay and ending up on the streets where I worked as an underage sex worker and drug abuse. Um, later in life, I was a victim of a hate crime, which resulted in an acoustic neuroma, a brain tumor which had to be removed, leaving an ugly scar on the back of my head, and leaving me deaf in the ear, which is why I don't have an AirPod. So yeah, I'd like to think I'm a survivor and resilient. Um, all of this coexists in my art because I have openly shared these stories in my writing and in front of audiences. And I never had the opportunity to pursue an MFA. As a spoken word poet published by small presses, I never had the essential marketing support writers need to help them be successful. I only managed to hustle my way onto the literary scene with that thick skin I developed during my time hanging out at the West Side Highway Piers in New York City. So as an artist, I have also been resilient. I've had to be resilient in order to survive. That's beautiful. Um, I define resilience as the ability to, to withstand, um, to withstand adversity, to withstand to withstand abuse, to withstand rejection, 
to withstand existence, um, which for me as a Black trans woman, while Afro-Latina trans woman, also on the intersection of just being an African-American woman in many ways, um, existence for me it requires a lot of labor. So constantly doing overtime for my existence. Um, so I basically consider a lot of my um, my work prior to my physical transition was very retrospective. So I was um, kind of um, rapping about just, just my journal entries and kind of spewing out my autobiography um, as I went and as I made records. And the simple idea of existing in the realm of rap and hip hop for me was um, very resilient and contributed a lot to how I consider survival through art. Um, and I never was able to con contextualize both of those things, but it was happening as I was doing it. Um, so then it came to a point where my, my past met up with my future, which was my physical transition, social transition, artistic transition. And now I'm basically living through experiences again to be able to write about them. So I'm actively being resilient and actively surviving so that I can well, I hope to survive to be able to tell my story yet again as I've entered into um, my physical journey of my transition, so. Ms. Bogey, thank you so much. And I love this concept of art as survival. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, is, is easy to relate to. I think that's, you know, a, a lot of artists feel that way. And I'm wondering what you all feel about um, this concept of art as survival. Do you relate to it? Um, you know, how, how do you kind of, how do you relate to that, I guess, is my question. Um, for me, I'll, does anyone want to go first? Sorry. No, you. No, no, no. Okay. Um, art, yeah, most certainly, I think because art, excuse me, art, as, art has become survival for me because in many ways, I wasn't, I, before I embarked on my journey as a lyricist and as an MC and started to like tour and stuff like that, I quite frankly felt like I was getting by in many ways. And um, I often felt like I didn't want to really share my story because of how many like wild intersections it was on. And it was just safe to say that nobody really would understand quote unquote. Um, so I considered survival um, the ability to live, the ability to live freely, the ability to express freely. That's my interpretation of survival. So I was only able to do that through art. Um, I've tried to walk away from um, the performative parts of my artistic um, kind of like space, um, my artistic reality, but that it just didn't work. And I quite frankly didn't feel like I was... Um, surviving much I it took me back to a place of just kind of like getting by so I do credit a lot of my survival to art and I frankly don't think that I would be able to survive without it um I feel um like art creating um <clears throat> you know either whether it's making music or drawing or writing it's always been a response um to some kind of pain and some kind of trauma um some kind of disconnect in my life and it's always just been what has um kept me alive and um has allowed me to continue to cr keep creating um when I was very young and there was all there was a lot of you know, drama within the family and within the community. And then um, that I was, you know, just kind of like peripherally um, trying to, you know, be, a, you know, 12, 13 year old and survive and do my thing um, without being affected um, by these things that are painful. But then the rest of the world was like super homophobic and then super sexist. And there was just all these things that were in the way of me um, being a real person to myself and to the world. Um, so I needed, I found um, punk rock at the time. And that's kind of what um, kept me sane and grounded. Um, and even though that lent to like a lot of 
dealing with a lot of um, white supremacy and sexism and shitty people who are just really in the way of my uh, true narrative. Um, it was still such a magical, important, safe haven for me. And then, you know, as time passed, um, I just started writing more about um, sexual trauma, sexual violence, and being a survivor. Um, and then that also, you know, it, it like forced me to shift what platform I was creating on because of sexism and, you know, terrible people and gatekeepers. Um, but then, you know, it's like, the the industries the the plat the record labels the publishers the you know the 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 fans you know the people reading are not always there for you it's it's there's a few people who've always been around but the thing that I have always had is my voice and my um, eagerness to create um, so that has always kept me you know it's kept me um, just like excited about life you know which to me is is survival and surviving. Um, cause I, I noticed this thing where, um, when I'm the most emotionally like stable and grounded and kind of like more in check mental health wise, I noticed that I don't give a crap about the industry and what they think. And I don't care about reviews and I hate social media. I, I was a publisher. I, I started my zine in the nineties. And then I did graphic novels in the early 2000s it, or it started into graphic novels. And then my most recent project is a tarot card deck. And what I've learned is just every project has a different fan base, every, you know, and then social media tries to like pigeonhole you and like keep you into like a craft, like one craft so you can get more followers and you can have very linear branding so then you can make money. And like, yeah, like I get that that is appealing but there's, you have to be yourself. And you know, and if that linear branding is yourself, you don't work it. But if it's not, and you're a Gemini with a Gemini Mercury like me, and you wanna do all these things and you communicate in all these ways, and it's your survival, then social media kind of like, it's kind of stressful, kind of party killer. Um, but yeah, um, the, the eagerness to create and the, the inspiration to create, and I'm inspired by love, I'm inspired by, the fall of empire and that's it those are my two favorite things to make art about awesome all right yeah so, I mean, yeah Go ahead. no i was just gonna uh, like chime in very briefly and say yeah art for me is survival and i think it's important for us to share our stories and and share them through art however we can because you know, it's, it's important. We, we are the chroniclers of our histories. And it's important for other people to, to, to hear our stories or see our stories through our own eyes. That is so, that is so, sorry, that is so strong. I feel, I, I do also feel like I have such a responsibility to archive history that is going to be um, referenced in a very near or far future. Awesome. Wow. Thank you all so much. And don't apologize for having more to say. We want to hear all of it. So, <laughs> um, so this next question is um, kind of deeply rooted um, in this idea of um, borderlands that we discussed in the introduction. Um, and so I'll start off with a quote by Gloria Anzaldúa. She says, the struggle is inner. Chicano, Indio, American Indian, Mojado, Mexicano, immigrant Latino, Anglo in power, working class, Anglo, Black, Asian. Our psyches resemble the border towns and are populated by the same people. The struggle has always been inner and plays out in the outer terrains, um, meaning in the physical world. So um, awareness of our situation must come before inner changes, which in turn comes before changes in society, um, nothing happens in the real world unless it first happens in images in our heads. Um, and so kind of with that quote in mind, um, how can we decolonize literature, art, and music, um, taking into account the inner struggles that Ansel Dua describes in her quote? I have a long-winded answer to that. Um, so let me just share this. Um, 
like my heritage comes from immigrant Latinos. My grandmother separated from my grandfather and moved to New York City from Ecuador with her two daughters and two sons in the late 60s. And the women who worked at a factory for Sweet and Low by the Navy Yards in Brooklyn. My mother met a Puerto Rican man who was supposedly my father and disappeared. But when I was about three, she met an Ecuadorian married man with children. And my mom and I moved in with them to an apartment in Bushwick, which was an immigrant community in the 70s, mostly made up of Puerto Ricans, Blacks, and the few Italians that remain. Except for not seeing anyone that resembled my family, my friends or myself on television other than on PBS. It was not until the 80s when my mom decided it would be safer for me to go to an elementary school in Queens that I became aware we were poor and minorities. There was a school bus that picked up kids from the neighborhood and drove us into Maspeth. And we were greeted daily with, the Spicks are here, the Spicks are here. Mm -hmm. And later in life, when I was also rejected by my mom for coming out as gay, I famously believed that I became all those things society expected me to become because I thought it was the only thing that I could be. And I had to find inner peace before I could change my life around. So by the time I started writing, I had so much to share and say. It was liberating and healing for me to be able to express all of this creatively. And again, even though I had no formal education, I wanted to share my own personal experiences before an older white man from the Midwest decided to tell my story. Mm -hmm. And I think this is how we decolonize literature. It's important for us to continue sharing our experiences because this is how others can learn about our inner struggles and become aware of that. And at the end of the day, we all just want to be seen and heard. And again, only we can tell our stories and share the world around us. And unfortunately, that also involves calling out all the bullshit because people are gonna keep telling our stories for us. There, there was some, like, there was, I hear about it like every now and then like, oh, blah, 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 got six figures for this totally appropriative story blah 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 and like I don't I'm not gonna name names because I don't luckily I don't remember who they are um <laughs> but it just happens all the time and it's so it's so hurtful and it's it's so um terrifying but yeah we have to continue telling our story and um and even like deconstruct the the, the inability to do that within us I think that I I compromised my story by um, when I was younger, by just being very focused on um, like false idols, very mm -hmm. white punk rock scenes, and just kind of not really um, looking at my family beyond, you know, homophobia and, you know, growing, being like the weirdo and La Familia Cubana and like, you know, like all, I have a lot of books out about being the weirdo and La Familia Cubana, but like, once I did the tarot deck, I was like so much, it was after a, a, an era of depression, of self-hate and a lot of connecting to ancestral magic and that need to like deconstruct um, my own bullshit to like really um, just have a, a more like all-encompassing better view of um, my identity as opposed to like this wounded weirdo Latina who's like never gonna be Latina enough. And like, that's what the, the industry does to us. It makes you feel like, and there, there was all, I just remember just growing up, like in, when I was in my twenties and just kind of becoming more known in the industry and stuff. And articles were always like, this isn't what your typical Latina would look like. And I'm just like, what do you want me to be wearing? Una bata casa de flores. I'm just like, you know, like be this, which I am at home. I have so many robes. I, I make platanos every day. But it's like, I'm all, all these things. And it's like, how can we make sure that the, that we, we keep, you know, we, we, we keep um, uh, just like, yeah, like telling our stories and being out there and, and being honest, um, whether or not, you know, somebody's gonna buy our story. Um, I guess that's what YouTube is for. And that's what the social media is for that I hate so much. Yeah um second that <laughs> um sorry if there's background noise um i'm sure y'all are familiar 
I live in a Dominican household, aka Cuban household, Mexican household, everything. <laughs> um, but I think that decolonizing literature um, is important solely because I think no matter how often time goes on and things progress, our stories will always be, they'll always be like in the classified section. Like it's, they might not even make it to the paper. And um, I think that when we find, when people find our, people in life as life goes by, find themselves in positions looking for people like themselves, they will find our stories deep down in the crates. And of, of course now deep down in the internet and so forth. And it has some stories, unfortunately, don't always, aren't always archived um, ever so like, you know, properly because for me um, coming from ballroom, um, I won't say coming from ballroom, but growing up in New York City and having a space in ballroom and also identifying as at the time, um, I don't think that queerism was like really um, uh, an identifying label that, for example, I identified with. So for me, some of the things were very like linear, like it was like either you're this or you're that. So for me growing up, I identified as a femme queen in ballroom. And the stories of femme queens aren't really archived or documented. It's like if you were there to see it, you were there to see it. If you weren't, you weren't. Um, some some of the mo more celebratory parts of ballroom are documented, um, whether through VHS or through YouTube now, but the nitty gritty wasn't. So that's why I find it really important to um, make very literal music referencing and mirroring very literal experiences. So if you heard my latest single, well, not my latest single, but one of my more more recent songs titled Femme Queen, it's really just like a, a one, two, three, four, and five of the experience. Like it's very straightforward. It's, it's vulgar in many ways um, and extremely rated R, but that is a reality of my life of somebody growing up in ballroom in New York on the pier or or whatever like it's a very rated R experience and it's not censored to your age it's not censored to your demographic like in all reality everybody in ballroom gets treated the same like shit <laughs> unless you're you know a top tier winner so it's like those stories um so it's important for me to again be very frank and be very candid with um that experience which doesn't make me up as a person but it is the lack of um the lack of research or the lack of information that wasn't archived in that in that spectrum of life led me down a very dark path of um, misunderstanding myself and um confusing my my morals and like my core values with um, my identity and presentation and how I um, showed up in spaces. And although as you grow and feed the two, they will come together, they're not, I don't think that they're the same thing. Um, how I show up and how I present um, eventually ties into my moral values and like my core values, but I also need to make sure that I have a foundation within myself as who I am versus how people see me. And I didn't have much, um, I didn't have much to reference in literature or in music or in media. Um, of course, there was Paris is Burning, but again, that was very much so like the celebratory aspect of ballroom and what it was like to grow up in New York City as like a queer, um, queer person of color. So again, I take a lot of pride in just being super transparent and um, dumbing down the, 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 the verbiage and the dialogue that I use in some songs because I want people to get the very like candid, frank version. Like, yes, I, I can be killed and murdered just for being myself. Like, yes, men do fetishize me. Yes, heterosexual identifying men love to get penetrated by women with penises. Like, I have to, I have to say that. And um, so it's, that's my interpretation of decolonizing literature. Um, I do understand that there are, I do believe that I have civil duties and responsibilities to um, share a, a broader range of, of my experience or people, 
um, adjacent to my experience, but where I am right now, I'm solely archiving and putting out what is like extremely dear to me and what um what is happening next to me, behind me and in front of me. So I hope that later on, like while I continue to grow into my artistry, I'm able to um, decolonize literature that tells that tells stories of other people that like improperly or doesn't say it, you know, doesn't like archive it the right way. But right now it's like really a lot about what's happening in front of my face or what's happening to bodies like mine. So. Yep. I really appreciate um, you bringing up kind of the preservation of our stories. Um, I think that's, you know, just incredibly important. And, um, you know, it's, I'm wondering too, um, when you, think of this idea, right, of like preservation, of preserving our stories, um, you know, what effect do you feel like that has for the folks that come after you who, who are feeling these things, right? And maybe like your work is the first time they're ever seeing themselves reflected. Um, well, it, it's overwhelming and fulfilling and that is happening in current time. Like I, there are young um, trans girls that are like 14 and 15 and my song is like the very first time they ever heard themselves put into context, especially in a rap song, especially in hip hop. So um, I think that it is, again, it's overwhelming because for me, I'm solely just like taking a page out of my diary, but to know that so many people have the same exact story written in their diaries on the same day and the same year. And it's, it's a lot, <laughs> but I think that, um, I think that what I try to encourage other people that consume my story or like tap into my story is to tell theirs as well, because I, I just always hope and pray that it's a cyclical effect and that, um, and I always say that ins inspiration is a revolving door. So as much praise as I might get from someone that's saying, oh my God, thank you for sharing your story and, make and helping me see myself. I always tell them, please tell yours because your story inspires me too, or the ability to tell yours inspires me just as much as you inspire me. So I never want to be like praised on a pedestal. Um, my goal is really to just humanize like everyone and myself. So that's my contribution to equality, I guess. Thank you so much. Um, Christian, Emmanuel, um, I'm wondering what you both think um, of, you know, this necessity to preserve our stories and the implications um, for those who come after us. Um, I, I think I may have rambled a little bit about that already um but um but yeah i just think it's really um important and it's also important for us to um value the people who are being inspired by us because i think um there's something i experienced where there's people who inspired me and when i've reached out and i've been like look i'm old now and doing cool stuff let's collaborate let's they're kind of standoffish and this it's always it's all, uh, it's always cis white women. And it's like this awkward thing that happens. Um, and then, and you know, with every demographic, it's, it's gonna, there's gonna be some kind of awkwardness or fetishization or, or racism or, you know, all kinds of drama. But I don't know, I, I just think it's important for people to like, like if, for people, if, if you see your art in somebody else's, somebody younger, somebody who is marginalized in, in the world and, and obviously is inspired by you, it's important for us to um, support that and be excited about it. And um, I just think, I don't know, I, I feel like, I don't know if this is specific to punk, but there's so much shame with success um, where I come from. And then... Um, so I don't know, it, it was just really hard um, to, to, to like feel like this true um, kind of exchange and support. Not Sometimes I felt it, but I don't know. I just think it's important to um, support people that are coming after you and also to continue. Um, I think this is what I said before to just continue telling your story without a filter 
Um, I think we filter ourselves to make money and we filter ourselves to get fans and we filter ourselves um, because of our insecurities and, and stuff like that. And, um, you know, there, there's a, a book that I wrote called Bad Habits that is about um, healing from sexual violence and moving to New York City and doing a lot of drugs. And I released it as um, fiction because I wasn't out to my mom. Um, and I look back at that and I'm like, fuck that. Like, who cares? Who cares? Piss off some family members. And I like, I totally get not wanting to piss off family members, but then, no, I don't, I'm 40. No, <laughs> like, I, I just really believe in, in living your truth and pissing people off. And like, you know, and a lot of the time if they say, oh, they're not ready to handle your sexuality. They're not ready to handle conversations on racism, on sexism. That's a problem because people mm -hmm. are having pe people who are 10, 12 years old are having those conversations. Why can't mm -hmm. older generations, you know? So anyways, I just think it's important or not just older generations, but conservative outlets, conservative, um, liberal, um, you know, media outlets and stuff. And I, yeah, I just think it's important um, for all of us to continue being honest um, and to continue um, kind of like pushing the envelope and, and you know, you were all saying about um, having a responsibility to do so. And, and I told, I definitely feel that. Um, and then, yeah, it is real for people who've been doing their thing for a million years to feel exhausted every now and then to be like, oh, you know, you know, the, these younger folks are telling this story and it's, it's easier for them to have a platform. It's easier. Blah, 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 blah. Um, but you know, you just, you just kind of have to um, be really proud of that and really proud that you were a part of making it easier for them um, by, by telling your story back in the day when nobody wanted to hear it. Um, and yeah, I think it's just important um, to not really um, limit the, to, to always tune in to the things that are making you angry, that are making you um, want to fight the things that you're like, this, this can't be happening anymore. Like this way of life, you know, there's, there's so many stories about, um, you know, like heartbreak and, and terrible parents and terrible families and like all these things that kind of shape our like cultural identities. Um, and then sometimes it's like, oh, there's not enough about us like celebrating our cultural identities and there's so much about our pain and, um, but then it's like, oh, well, there's a reason for that. Um, because like, you know, everybody wants to think that everything's cute and fun and everything is just, you know, um, like what's the, what's the, the holidays that are always appropriated. It's, it's always mm -hmm. Cinco de Mayo every day. Yeah. And, but no, yeah, it's important to, to um, archive your pain as well as your joy. That's like the most punk thing ever, I have to say. Like, say you know, so punk. <laughs> like destroy the filter and fuck everyone else. <laughs> I mean, it's just very important. And I think I think I used to I think that sometimes I had a filter because I love my family and mm -hmm. I, you know, like I, I had the filter for a reason. Um, because they were supportive in like these other ways, you know. Yeah. Um and my book, Spam Passion, it's from 2013, and it's all about um, um, realizing I'm queer and discovering um, the band Green Day and the scene that they're coming from, the East Bay punk scene that was around in the, it's still around, but the early 90s incarnation of it, um, and discovering that and like that being my new like oh you know this is a life I can have this is like a reality that um is accessible to me I just need to like find friends or you know go to California or figure it out you know but in the meantime I've got me and my music and my resilience and like one friend at school maybe but you know the book was all about this experience where you don't want to chop off your family because you don't want to lose your culture and you don't and you love your family and you're kind of almost like well I get why abuela's so homophobic I get it's not okay 
And when I'm older and can articulate myself a little better, I'm going to fight with her. I'm going to fight with all the family members about homophobia. But for now, you know, I, I kind of just want to hide with my music and, and survive and, and not, you know, make it through high school. And um, that's right. what the whole book is about. But yeah, it was a hard sell because nobody wanted to hear that being queer is hard. Everybody was like, well, do you get a girlfriend in the book? You know, do you come out to your mom? It's like, no, I just come out to Green Day. And like <laughs> all these people that I would, I, I actually didn't, I, I can't remember if I wrote about this in the book, if I get to that stage where I started writing to every band that I loved and like all the record labels. And I had all these like calling cards and I would like call people all the time. My mom's like, why, you know, you're getting a call from some guy in, in California at like eight, you know why? And I'm just like, oh, it's my new, I have all these new friends now, like punk, that's what punk is all about. It's about, you know, like getting rid of the barriers between um, celebrity and fan and, and, you know, being a community of artists. And, and that's what was magical to me. And I was like, oh, that, you know, that's what I want. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, and that's like how I'm gonna survive. Um, but it involved, you know, all these years of like navigating um, this wall I created between punk and survival and art. And then my family and like being a Juanita from West Miami and, you know, like how can these things merge? And, um, and I think that the way that it did merge and the way that I've been able to like feel grounded in, you know, the stories I told back then that were so full of rage um is has been by just continuing to tell more stories and um you know get to a place where I don't need to process you know um family dynamics and stuff like that and I don't know like there's just a lot of stuff that I don't need to process anymore in my writing in my art um because I already did and yeah it's, it's important for all of us to feel like like we did that, like we mm -hmm. um, coped in however way we needed to with that, our art. Bad ha to add to that, um, your story, Bad Habits, really like spoke a lot of that to myself when I read it. Oh, like, thank you. Yeah, I read it in like 2015 or something. And um, oh my God. I learned a lot about like decomposing the habits that I considered bad and like making them fluffy and glittery in my own way <laughs> oh my god that's so meaningful but that's to and that's totally like a one of my projects that's like weirdly I guess it's resurfacing more now since I did the tarot deck and it has more of an audience um but yeah it's just one of those projects that feels like it disappeared you know it's been 12 years since I released it so um but yeah it's like the same I'm I every time I try to rewrite a bad habits I'm like oh I already talked about like doing acid to deal with a shitty ex I don't need to do that again but and thank you and jumping in I mean that's that's beautiful that that's what's important I think um looking back we had to do our own research to find our own histories you know find our own books you know, find our own stories reflected through like literature. You know, I mean, I think teachers are important because now there is the, the potential for, for our histories to be taught, for, for a book like Borderlands to be like on our bookshelves. You know, um, it's, it's important to, to continue, you know, teaching this because, you know, like we, like, there was a time when, when this wasn't, taught in schools at all like we like I discovered all this working at a gay bookstore and I had to look for those stories that that shared my experiences mm -hmm. and you know so so it's important for us because our queer history is essential to inspire others moving forward absolutely all right, so we'll move into our final prepared question. Um, and we can open it up to the audience as well after um, for more questions. Um, 
And so um, while Ansel Dua expresses the discomfort of being a resident in the borderlands, she names that there have been compensations for this mestiza, mestiza meaning a woman of mixed race, um, as well as certain joys. One example of such is La Facultad. And Anzal Dua says of La Facultad that it is the capacity to see in surface phenomena, the meaning, the meaning of deeper realities, to see the deep structure below the surface, the one possessing the sensitivity um, is excruciatingly alive to the world. Can you speak of this idea of La Facultad um, and have you seen it manifest in your life and does it impact your work? Um, for me, I kind of relate that to the, um, like the definition or concept of the crown chakra, um, mm. where you're just aware of everything. You aren't worried about what you're not aware of. You're just super grounded, but then, and then you're also just kind of, you have a vision and you're, it's just this lack of anxiety and this lack of, um, you know, um, stress with, you know, your role in the industry and your, you know, are you Latina enough? Are you queer enough? Are you this enough? And like, you're, you're just kind of on me and I, I don't give a crap about, you know, the other stuff and I'm, and I'm fighting and I'm, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's about being grounded in your purpose for me. Um, and I kind of, I wrote down something oh yeah and it's like this feeling that I only get or I usually only get um after like a magical thing like interacting with somebody I have a crush on or working on a really amazing project with a person and then finishing and being like oh my god we did this and or you know getting a a really good response to your work or you you know getting published or something you know like an achievement so I try to get that feeling from taking showers running errands, making a dinner I'm proud of, so then I can have it every day because, um, yeah, I, I just have, with the pandemic especially, I, I feel like I've, it's really easy to lose touch when you're like an art machine and all your joy and groundedness comes from achievements. Um, so yeah, I, I try to push, I try to like remember what that feeling is like and try to implement it in things that aren't about um, romance and jobs. Like love and, and money are like, you know, it's just like the things we're even conditioned to prioritize because they're magical, yeah, it's whatever. But yeah, imagine getting that joy from just going for a walk. So I try. I, I've learned to be part of both worlds as a resident of my own borderlands in that I am proud to be Latinx, embracing my cultural heritage and history. And, and as an American, loving the better qualities of this country where I was born and raised, um, both as a Latinx American and a spoken word poet, I found often, I have often found myself in the paradox of being in spaces where I'm not recognized as legitimate or where I'm categorized as different. And therefore I'm constantly being asked to question my own existence. Mm -hmm. So there've been challenges in my life and as a spoken word poet, but Facultad has helped me realize what is and isn't important in the real world. Um, and one of my favorite quotes by Gloria is the following. Um, and someone in me takes matters into our own hands it eventually takes dominion over serpents, over my own body, my sexual activity, my soul, my mind, my weaknesses and strengths, mine, ours, not the heterosexual white man's or the colored man's or the states or the cultures or the religions or the parents, just our, mine. Thank you so much for sharing that quote as well. That was beautiful. That added so much more context to the question too. Um, I think that find, for me, finding um, finding sense of la facultad has been very complex for me. Um, I 
my my artistic journey has been kind of like divided into two places. Um, so when I first embarked on my musical journey, I presented to the world as as male or like queer identifying um, and just like genderly ambiguous before I was able to staple my womanhood and take pride in, um, you know, grabbing it by the horns. So the one thing I'm still struggling to find, um, to find compensation for myself outside of creating. Um, so very often the real world doesn't, I, I get no gratification from the real world. Um, and in all reality, most of my, most of the compensation that I could offer myself comes from kind of just like being creative in my imaginary world. And I hope I'm not misinterpreting the concept of la faculty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's quite complex, um, but I do take a lot of pride in being able to, um, again, as I mentioned in the beginning, be very like literal and forward with my work, although it does have um, many layers, but I'm, I'm now struggling to find a place where I, again, can engulf all of the things from um, as many walks of life that I do know of into my creations. And it has been very difficult solely because I think that there is, um, there are parts of my narrative that say, um, as a black trans woman, I, I deserve much more than what I can obtain. But also I do have a very, there's a very core belief in me that says the world doesn't owe me nothing. Mm -hmm. So, I'm really struggling to find um, a balance with give and take through through creation and just throughout my regular walk in life. I mean, sometimes in the midst of my artistry, again, I've been in I've been a self proclaimed artist for about I think like nine years now. So in the midst of that, I did have to pick up a nine to five here and there, and um, it was just a big yike. And it's not because I aspire to be like super famous or um, a millionaire or billionaire. I just really struggle with the fact that I cannot connect with the real world. And it is, it is quite complex. But um, again, I think that layering my work has allowed me to revisit it as a piece of archive and peel back the layers for my own research. Um, so now when I look back at certain things that I put out, it's even a learning experience for me to be able to acknowledge the walk of life that I was presenting throughout my art at that time. So it kind of helps me like look at another person's journey, even though it was me um, physically. So that is, that's kind of how I seen La Facultad manifest in my life and um, I think that it impacts my work in that way as well. Thank you so much for sharing. Any other thoughts on that before we move to the um, audience questions? That was, I, I don't know, I kind of want to revisit that one too, like amongst all of us. Because, <laughs> um, or what, like, what is, what is a facultad, what, what is it what does it mean to anyone else here i don't want to call anybody out but um i think it, it was very clear to us like how it shows up but what does it mean to us like anybody no <laughs> i don't know i'll do my own research on it then it's uh for me i just i think everybody just has such a personal um relationship to it because for me, I've, I'm reading, you know, and I've read the book and I've read about this idea, but I've always just been like, that's what happens when you don't have anxiety. And like, <laughs> so it's, that's for me, like I just, and I'm just, I'm kind of like, you know, I feel like sometimes I can be very cynical and black or white about things because I've been so isolated. I'm, I've never have this like, grounded partner or community situation that a, a lot of people in my life do um so I, I just get so like 
I just joke a lot and I get very cynical about um, the the concept of wellness. Mm -hmm. And I, I just got into taking care of myself in certain ways with like vitamins because of all this gastro gastrointestinal problems that I have. And I had to do a bunch of life changes. Um, and it made me realize like, oh, I'm very not grounded. And I, I like, you know, smoke a lot of pot or like, you know, go on, you know, like try to fall in love all the time to like be um, want, be as, you know, as, as like grounded as my work. This is Chippy. Oh, um, hi. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I just, um, the more that I've like figured out my mental health and I've figured out um, how to keep making my art without it being like, a tool for my pain, you know, and it's just like a tool for my power and for my communication and for my passion and um, has been so much for me about getting out, getting these like anxious layers out of the way because I'm going to stay angry at the industry. I'm going to stay angry at white supremacy, at all the like cis white gatekeepers that have made telling my story a living hell. And it's, it's you know, it's I play in, in punk rock bands and I've always been very into pop punk as a subgenre and it's a complicated subgenre and it's just you know it's just a weird place to be weird place to have been a feminist in 2003 and um so I don't know I just I feel like it's just always been I've always been struggling with the things I love because they they're they're like and I'm sure everybody feels it like industries are terrible film look at film and look at you know it's just like everything is so um, has gone through this terrible capitalist meat grinder. Um, mm -hmm. And now when we make things and when we create things, it's like, I don't want to be affected by that. I don't want my insecurities to be about what, you know, who got what in the top 10 list on Pitchfork, like some magazine I don't even like, you know, it's like, I, like, I really need to get away from all of that and just be me and my work and me and the love that comes from you know, support. And, um, and then if there's hostility, and there's, there's anger, it's, it's usually this, the kind of hostility I, I want to like combat is, is like, you know, actual, like violent, um, threatening, not like some hater that doesn't like my drawings, like, you know, it's just kind of, um, it's very important for me to just not be stuck in obsessive, anxious places. Um, in order to feel that faculta like idea or, or live it? I think for me, I mean, faculta is, is making, you know, being comfortable within your own skin, um, both as, as, like I said, like as a Latinx, as an American. Um, I think this is a good, like, could I share a poem? Yes, please. I'm going to share um, Americano, which I think probably encompasses, encompasses what, what that means to me. So I look at myself in the mirror trying to figure out what makes me an American. And I see Ecuador. I see Puerto Rico. I see Bruja spirits moving across the backs of Santeros, splatter with the red blood of sacrificed chickens on their virgin white clothes and blue beads for Yemaya, practicing religions without a roof. I see my own blood running the white sheets of a stranger, proud American blue jean labels on the side of the bed. I see Don Rosario and his Guayabera sitting outside the bodega with his Puerto Rican flag, reading time in the eyes of alley cats. I see my mother trying to be more like Marilyn Monroe than Julia de Burgos. I see myself trying to be more like James Dean than Federico Garcia Lorca. I see Gloria, Sant Gloria Stefan, Carlos Santana, Ricky Martin, Jennifer Lopez, more than just sporadic Latin explosion, more like fireworks on El Cuatro de Julio, as American as Bruce Springsteen, Janis Joplin, Elvis Presley, Aretha Franklin. I see Taco Bells and chicken fajitas at McDonald's. I see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple. I see Cheetah Rivera on Broadway. 
You see, I am as American as lemon merengue pie, as American as Wonder Woman's panties, as American as Madonna's bra, as American as the Quinteñeros, the Abduls, the Lees, the Jacksons, the Kennedys, all of us immigrants to this soil somehow. Does none sound American Indian to me, as American as television snow after the anthem is played, and I am not ashamed. Jose, can you see? I pledge allegiance to this country, tis of me, land of dreams and opportunity, land of proud detergent names and commercialism, land of corporations. If I can win gold medals at the Olympics, if I can sign my life away to die for the United States, ain't no small town hick gonna tell me I ain't an American because I can speak in two languages. Coño carajo, fuck you. This is my country too, where those who not believe in freedom and diversity are the ones who need to get the hell out. Wow, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to invite um, Christy and Ms. Boogie as well um, to share, if you'd like to share work, um, you know, we'd love to hear it. Could, um, I have two ideas and I can let y'all pick. I was gonna read, I'm working on a, on a graphic novel, it's gonna be science fiction, um, but it's, you know, it's all about, there's a love story and there's a band and, you know, um, but it's gonna be in the future and there's gonna be aliens. And um, so I can read a piece from that, which is currently like just text, it's like brand new, um, but I, I've been working on it slowly for a while, or I can pull a tarot card for it for the evening and read, give you all, give a tarot card reading. Both of those sound amazing. the tarot card reading. <laughs> um, I'll do the tarot card and then time permitting, I'll read the new sure. thing. Awesome, thank you. Seeing a lot of tarot card in the chat. <laughs> So I'm gonna, everyone just think about your feelings and I'm gonna pull a card. Um, this is the deck that I published in 2018, 19. Um, it's called the Next World Tarot. And I don't know, I kinda, I just like pull, pulling a card for, there was a full moon this week. And um, you know, my feelings about this talk have been like, I'm so inspired now to go work on the new novel um and like you know not have a filter and um reminding me that that was punk I was like oh you know I have so much issues with punk but then I remember you know why I come from like why I was committed but um so yeah I don't know I feel like as much as it's nice to remember where you come from it's really nice to be inspired and to grow out of um confined art practices so we got the Wheel of Fortune. And um, the Wheel of Fortune is all about having access to like so much of your gifts and so much of your power and um, knowing how to share it. But I'm gonna read from the booklet because that's what we're doing. We're reading. Um, okay. In the depths of opulent nature and slipshot back alleys of the South, the Wheel of Fortune is waiting for us by the lake, the front porch, the nightclub door, the intersection between home and exhibition. They are a beacon, a warning, and a celebration. They know the best swimming spots and the most dangerous leaps that may save or destroy you in an instant. Co-conspiring with goddesses and demons, they honor wisdom and any stage of your given path. They ask you to truly ask yourself the hard questions, the ones that may expose failure and the ones that may let you shine. The Wheel of Fortune is a turning point of choices. They ask you to think twice, do your values nourish you or are they complacent towards a system that's set to destroy your truth? The Wheel of Fortune doesn't close their door. They ask you to keep spinning until you feel totally safe. 
<laughs> All right. Um, I'm so nervous that? to read the new thing, but I'll read it because I like being nervous. <laughs> Um, awesome. so, so yeah, it's a graphic novel. It's going to be a, a graphic-ish novel about the future and um, it's dystopian. There's going to be, I, I just don't want to like give too many details because I like, I'm a Cancer rising and moon, but I'm very evolved. So I hate nostalgia. I just like mm -hmm. secrets, <laughs> um, secret projects, not shady secrets. Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's this world um, that is, you know, it's it's about 300 years from now and or, uh, it's gonna be a couple hundred years from now. And there's this world that is um, a very fascist regime similar to what we experienced, but more concrete, more um, privatized and um, terrifying because the environment is so, terrible there's like a massive hole in the ozone um we had a good 50 years things got better bernie was eventually elected but then something happened and we'll have to hear about it um when the book is out but um oh wait am i okay sorry i'm bad at the computer um but yeah it'll be focused on a band and their their journey and the main character is gonna fall in love with someone and so yeah and I'm still on the fence if anybody ever wants to talk about this I'm, I'm on the fence of, with how to represent you know um everybody I don't know I've never written something this fictionalized before so I'm excited about representing my culture in a way that I haven't before um, but still representing it um but yeah I'm gonna read about Abuela My great abuela came of age during the time of Xerox fanzines, sexual taboo, and the ozone layer. She played in hardcore bands who never made it big, but rather made big strides for their communities, for the revolution. She is the reason I do what I do, and the ancestor who screams the loudest when my head gets lost in my asshole. My great abuela warned me in dreams and coffee grains and cowrie shells and effervescent prophecies that made me half sick and half elated. She warned me that, yes, Teresita, looks like punk saved you too, but you and your bandmate might be falling in love with each other and I'm not sure how available that will make you for the next revolution, as I see it creeping behind the radiation, the smog. Ay, vamos, abuelita. Calmate los nervios, que I'm a big girl. I knew I was stronger than that. I was a warrior who represented the revolution, the dissent, the war against the Republic of Dystopia, the war against systemic racism and violence. And I, I guess I'm still human. I guess my innards feel compressed as butterflies swerve between my lungs and my pussy, grabbing onto my large intestine and screaming, oh, my fucking heart, fucking heart. A couple months ago when the universe started showing me the truth, it felt like drugs like that threshold between swallowing the pill and euphoria when you can clearly understand what dying feels like, but finally you understand what living feels like. So yeah, Fulanito definitely had a crush on me. All right, that's it. Wow, I love it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm standing out. <laughs> yeah, oh my God, I'm, I, I, oh, I need to be in like some kind of a like, right, we should start a writer's club. Cause I'm just like, I never get feedback and <laughs> actually that would be so awesome. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we'll discuss out, out. Yes. Um, yes. After the meeting. I would love that. I'd Thank be amongst you so us. much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, I don't, I don't have any thing archived right now that I would like to share. Um, I am in motion of a lot of my creation at the very moment. So um, I do encourage everyone to, to follow me. That sounds so cliche, but um, I'm unraveling a lot of my work as, as I speak, but 
Um, so, but I do want to recommend a, a beautiful artist that I listen to a lot to um, to reflect and to ground. Um, her name is Buica. She is an Afro Spaniard artist um, based in Spain, and um, I think she's amazing. So. That's my recommendation for the day. I'll, should I type it or spell it aloud? Um, I'll type it. Um, yeah, you know, if you want to type it, that's okay. perfect. Just type it in the chat, but um, it's spelled B-U-I-K-A. Thank you so much. And um, that's actually, this is perfect because my next question was going to be um, from the chat. Um, Allison had a really great question. Um, asking if the panelists um, can recommend a piece of media, either a song, book, artwork that they are enjoying right now. That was mine. And, and, but like also another thing that I, just to add to it, um, I really enjoy Buica because a lot of my work at the very beginning again was about kind of like impersonification. Like who, who can I, there was nobody that I felt was like me or that was doing what I was doing. So I had to just find people that I felt adjacent to. And um, although I, although and I'm, an, I'm an MC and like I rap and hip hop is my genre, like I secretly moved through through my musical creation, like as an R&B diva or like opera singer. So that's what I think I am in my head. Um, didn't receive the training or was granted the gift <laughs> vocally. But um, yeah, that's why I really like her. Cause I'm just like, if I was a singer, that's what I would sing about, what I would look like, who I, that would it just was really parallel to my story at the time. So, but yeah, it's my recommendation. Awesome. I can't wait to listen to her. I want to do a plug for, um, I was just reading Jericho Brown's The Tradition, which is an amazing poetry collection that I have really been enjoying and I think, you know, others would definitely appreciate. Awesome, thank you. I don't know what to say, I hate everything. No, I don't hate everything, I just like- <laughs> Tell us to read all of your work. <laughs> I want um I'm I want to check out the musician that you just told us about um yeah, because I don't know I I listen to so much old stuff all the time like I listen to Joey Ventura Celia Cruz Celia Cruz is always you know and I feel like new generations will will identify Celia Cruz with like grandma or like you know so she's always someone to get into now I just like I listen to so much old stuff all the time like old punk um x-ray specs and the stooges and x-ray specs is one of the the old old fronted by a woman of color polystyrene old punk from the 70s um so yeah I'm I'm just having a weird moment of of not knowing new things because I'm not touring or traveling and I, I I'm just like such an old fart with my vinyl collection and um I'm I just listen to so much Celia Cruz and Yoni Ventura Yoni Ventura all day like yesterday and and then I just I listen to a lot of um Miles Davis and Billie Holiday and like I'm like yeah I'm your tia Hey, Christy, um, have you ever heard of a band called Soda Stereo? They were like an 80s Argentinian, like new wave punk band. And no, I I'll, um, I'll like look them, them up. Soda yeah. Stereo. How is it spelled? Um, soda, S-O-D-A, okay. Stereo. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. cool, I found it. Cool. Um, I mean, thank you so much for sharing all of these, um, you know, so we'll definitely have to um, listen to them and read them and yeah, be inspired by them. All right, so um, if there, are there any more audience questions at all? Chippy. Tippy wants to know. 
I have a question, but give me a minute to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I heard another cat somewhere. No, it's just my nephew. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Today, he's a cat. <laughs> Does anyone, does anyone um, feel like, what are some of the things that help you folks um, like create these days? Or if creating is even on your agenda right now, I, I had to kind of um, relieve myself of my duty of creation. Cause a lot of the times I felt like, again, when I was mentioning like the civil duty thing, like there came a point in, in my creation where I was just like, I have to create for my people because my people are not being represented. And, but I had to relieve myself, but like, I'm finally coming back into that space. Um, but I don't know what I did to get there. It's just, it's just happening. So if anyone has any pointers because writer's block is real. <laughs> no, it is. I have to say, um, I was often criticized because a lot of my work is political and throughout the entire Trump administration, I withheld from writing because I did not just want to put something out there um, because I, I, I was reactive to so many things going on in the world um, with wow. like Black Lives Matter and with COVID and, and white supremacy. But now I'm totally inspired to like share and, and write and you know, I'm totally inspired um, to, to continue creating, so. So do you think that it just like happened in orbit or was there like, did you deliberately activate something? I, I think it was a little bit of both. I think I didn't just wanna like, just, just, just put stuff out there um, and, and I just kind of needed to absorb everything that was going on. You know, sometimes it's okay to to just step back and, and listen to the world around you, you know? Yeah. I'm terrified because, like, I'm packaging a single now, like, to put out for for Valentine. And, like, I ha I'm doing, like, a music video and stuff. And I just feel like I'm about to, like, bungee jump. And I never bungee jumped before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's why I asked. I don't know. I just feel like... I have for more than more than ever, I've now had to rely on just the simple fact that people appreciate what I do or make and it does something for them that eventually in the long run fulfills me. But um, yeah, so quite terrified, but I'm gonna make it I happen. have a very, um, my mo so this is even all over my astrological chart. Um, my motivation to create a lot of the time has to do um, with love, um, whether it's being excited to, sh to create something to show somebody that I love or to create something that is about something I love. And it's, and it's just so, you know, and it can range from like writing songs about my ex and my my band being more concerned about you know is the label gonna pick it up is and i'm like is my ex gonna hear it and feel something because that is all i care about so that's my motivation and it's okay yes be motivated by <laughs> feelings and just by like i've broken so many hearts i've broken so many hearts in that process <laughs> <laughs> it's it's what you it's so sad but then it's like oh you have to do yeah. I don't know I just think it's bit like so the next world tarot wasn't about a partner it was about this deep love that I had for my community for queer community for the revolutions that were kind of like incited by you know my whole 20s early 30s and being in like activist scenes um and even if it was a failure, even if it was dramatic, which, you know, it just was. And, but so much magical things happen, whether, whether it was like something small, like politicizing a friend or a family member um, to something huge, like 
raising a ton of money for like a, a homeless cold, you know, like just something like supporting the community and so much work has been done and so much magical stuff has come from um, this community that I've been a part of. And this deck has, it's like 78 drawings of people from all different communities I've been a part of. They're all like friends, you know, and some of them I met about five of them I met um, to shoot for the deck, but they were like, you know, they were friends of friends who like ran into me at a dinner party. You know, it wasn't, it, it was like this very, very community based, but, but then now I'm so isolated and I'm like, how did I even get 78 people to like talk to me? I'm like, I just feel like this weird old person, which is half of it is like, I'm, I'm grounded in my accomplishments. I'm grounded in like my new project. I'm, but then I, I, I miss that huge community, you know? So, but when I did this, ah, um, I think the universe is like, shut up, bitch. You still have a community. There's just a pandemic. But like, but no, um, when I did this, I was very immersed in community and in, I was very sad. I was very heartbroken. I was like very depressed, but the queer community my best friend um was a party promoter like it was just like um so much magical stuff was happening that I couldn't I didn't have the time to like kind of like fester in my sadness I was like just so inspired to to make this deck and to reconnect with my ancestral magic and all that stuff and um I don't know Sorry, I'm just rambling now. Um, but the motivation to do it was for this love of a community. And, I'm, and you know, I, I wasn't even thinking about making money off of this. I went to grad school. So I, can, I was like, I'll get a teacher job and I'll keep cocktailing. And, you know, like I, I understand when I don't make money off a project, it, it isn't always because the project isn't loved. It's because, you know, there, there's just like a market that's looking for something a little more positive, a little more... Nah, nah, nah you know, and so when I did this, it's like it have it being successful was all this very exciting, weird, magical thing that I'm grateful for. But um, when I did it, I did not expect that at all. I just kind of did it for the love of the community. And that's kind of how everything I've ever done is it's like, I'm just so excited to, to show the community. Or, you know, the muse. Thank you for sharing. I think we lost Miss Boogie. Uh, her computer died. Um, she'll be back um, in a moment. <laughs> okay. Okay, great. Any more audience questions? Um, Christy and Emmanuel, do you have any questions for each other or, you know, for the audience even? <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to, um, again, bring up the fact that, um, Christy, we, we did a reading years ago at the San Francisco Library of Harmistead and Maupin, and I, I remember that being such a wonderful experience. And so it's great to see you again and yeah. be in the same space as you, even though it's not physical. Yeah, it's so, I don't know. I feel um, very nostalgic for that time period and those years of being more involved in literature because after the deck, this is another I hate capitalism speech, but after the tarot deck came out, it's like, you know, like academic groups or, you know, like individual people were still reaching out to me about stuff. But literary things and like literary, like focused academic academia um, was not reaching. I like it's all stopped. Like I stopped doing readings. I stopped because it was like, oh, she put out a tarot deck. She's not an author. And like, it's so annoying because there's this whole book. And like, it's just like, I don't know. Tarot doesn't even fit in illustration, for example. It's like, it's not as like revered as comics or 
you know, film posters. Like it's some weird, like, oh, freaks. The like, tarot is for freak artists. And it's just this, and now it's gaining more of a like respectful traction in like publishing. But when I was working on it, I just got, I felt so sad. And like, I really missed that whole energy of reading at libraries and touring, reading a lot with different authors. We also read at Blue Stockings in New York City. That's right. That's right. Yes. I love that place. Okay, <laughs> All right, so um, I think that that concludes our panel. Um, it's almost 7.30 and I wanna thank you so, so, so much um, for joining us tonight. This was super, super fun. I hope you all enjoyed it as well. Um, yeah, and just I'm excited to um, see the work that you all are coming out with soon. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much, Vanessa. And, oh, of course. And, and Jer and everybody who put this together and having us. Thank you all. This was so cool. It was really lovely to see you all. Um, yeah, thank you. And I mean, we should talk writing group. Like, yes. Fuck. Yeah. <laughs> I love feedback. Same as is. Christy, I'm actually, I'm working on a story that's, that sounds very similar to the one that you are working on. 